Hello, welcome to chapter 17. Uh, this is our last chapter that is dealing with structures associated with the nervous system. So it's been a long journey. We started way back at the end of 231 doing neuron anatomy and neurophysiology. Then we worked our way through the spinal cord, the brain, and the autonomic nervous system. So chapter 17 is specific on what we call the special senses. So not general sensations of touch and temperature and pain and pressure, but these particular sensations um, that we have to have special receptors for. So the sense of taste, the sense of smell, which we're gonna do in this first one, um, vision, which is dealing with the eyeball, and hearing and equilibrium, which is dealing with the inner ear. So we'll hit on all of those in the individual video lessons. Smell and taste are very similar in their physiology, so and they're not super complex, so I'm gonna put them both in one video. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we're going to take a look at smell first, or olfaction. Um, the olfactory structures or organs associated with the reception of smell um, is found in the mucosa that's lining the superior nasal cavity. So we can remember some of our bone anatomy from 231, maybe, maybe not. So if you remember, we had our nasal conch, so superior, middle, um, we're part of the ethmoid bone, and our inferior nasal conch was its own set of bones, the facial bones. Oh, she's starting to walk on her treadmill. <laughs> she always does this. I just got started. Silly kitty. They will be entertainment while I continue to teach. Um, and then so of the ethmoid bone, if you remember the cribriform plate right here, and then the frontal bone with the frontal sinus and the sphenoid bone there. So that's kind of where we're at in the skull. Um, and most of these olfactory receptor cells are located in the, that superior part, probably close to the, the, the inferior surface of the cribriform plate in the nasal cavity and the superior nasal conch. Um, but the whole nasal cavity is lined by this mucosa. It is just in that superior region where we have the olfactory receptor cells. These are these blue cells. They are neurons. They are bipolar neurons. So if you remember, a bipolar neuron had the centrally located cell and the two branches coming off of it. So we saw that back in chapter 12. All right, so the olfactory neurons are kind of snugged and packed tightly in this um, olfactory epithelium. That's just a collection of all of the epithelial cells along with the olfactory receptor cells. And we have some glands. So olfactory glands are embedded, uh, kind of originating in that lamina propria, which is the connective tissue, which sits underneath epithelial tissue. Um, secretes mucus to the surface. So that's true of all mucose membranes. Um, and it is in this mucus that the dendrites, the receptor regions on these olfactory cells are kind of embedded within this mucus. So these are called olfactory dendrites. In some resources, they may be called um, olfactory cilia. Either one of those terms is fine. So for smell to happen, your odorant molecules, in this case a rose, it looks like it's going to be sniffed up your nose. It dissolves in the mucus and then goes and finds the receptor that recognizes that chemical structure, binds, probably opens ion channels, allowing sodium to rush in, but it could be a lot of different mechanisms, depolarizes that olfactory neuron, and that sends the signal up to the olfactory bulb, which is right over here in this bigger picture. And then that's gonna send in this olfactory tract back towards your olfactory cortex, if you remember, which is located on the temporal lobe of your brain. So that's the structure of the um, olfactory organs. Did I miss anything? Oh, um, there are also, so these are the supporting cells. I wanna make sure I mention that. I mentioned the mucosa and the mucus. We have a little bit of replacement of our olfactory neurons. So a lot of times neurons do not replenish themselves, but there's a few exceptions and your, your smell neurons do. So if you were to sniff something very strong and potentially damaging, it might affect your sense of smell for a couple days, but then um, the neurons can regenerate. So that's kind of what this one is showing you that it's kind of growing and will produce a new set of olfactory dendrites to allow for the reception to take place. All right, um, so then the next slide, oh, before we move on, I guess it's kind of along the same lines. Um, all of our olfactory receptors are G proteins. So um, we saw a little bit back in chapter 16, if you remember G proteins, 
We have the receptor is kind of located in the plasma membrane. It's usually like a little, what I'd like to call the radiator. Um, it's going to be associated with the G protein. And then, right, so here's our plasma membrane. And then somewhere down here, we're going to have an enzyme. And the enzyme will eventually make a second messenger. Okay, so that was just, that's just a review of G proteins. So all of those receptors that are found on the surface of those dendrites are G protein receptors. So they have to have a receptor site for whatever the smell is. So if the, the odorant molecule is rose, right? So here's my rose molecule <clears throat> landing in um, that receptor. It activates the G protein. G protein activates the enzyme. The enzyme produces a second messenger. In this case, it's going to be cyclic AMP. And you can see that down here in that step one, two, three. So the odorant molecule binds, binds the receptor protein activates the G protein, which then activates the enzyme, in this case, adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase increases cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP then goes and does stuff inside of the cell. In this case, it's binding to um, an ion channel. So cyclic AMP opens an ion channel, sodium is rushed in, and we depolarize the cell. We produce an action potential. So that's what's happening along the olfactory neurons. Um, that are being that are picking up these odorant molecules but for us our conscious brain right so our olfactory cortex and our temporal lobes to recognize smell we don't have the sensitivity to recognize one odorant molecule so typically you have to have a collection of action potentials um, actively stimulating and firing those olfactory neurons so together you are producing what's called a generator potential and this, this high frequency of action potentials being produced um, sends this generator potential through all those olfactory neurons to your olfactory bulb, which then synapses onto other neurons in that olfactory tract. And it is a, you know, um, the sensitivity to these molecules which give us the ability to smell them. So the book talks a little bit about one that we purposely put into stuff so we can smell it. I think it's called beta mercaptan which is the odor that they put in natural gas, because natural gas is colorless, it's odorless, it's invisible, um, but it's dangerous. So for a way for humans to be able to recognize if there's a leak or um, a gas line open, they insert this beta mercaptan, which we are very sensitive to. So we would be able to recognize very small amounts of that particular odor molecule um, in, the, in the air. I think it's, I don't know, the statistics are in your textbook. I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, but there are some things we aren't as sensitive to. So we have some uh, variance on the sensitivities of certain odors. And that's in humans, too. So, um, you know, dogs have a way better sense of smell than humans do. They have a lot more surface area in their olfactory epithelium, and they have more variety and uh, sensitivity to certain things. So that's why you can train dogs to be bomb-sniffing dogs, drug-sniffing dogs. They have COVID-sniffing dogs and cancer-sniffing dogs and diabetes, insulin um, sniffing dogs. So they have that um, a lot more sensitivity than we do. All right. Um, and then just lastly, olfactory receptors decline in number as we get older. So we reduce that replenishing of those neurons. And so that may be why grandma or grandpa has strong perfume or aftershave because they've got to put on a lot more to stimulate the same perception of smell that it might be strong to younger noses. But it's to them, it's just totally normal. They just are putting on way more than younger noses would maybe appreciate. Okay, so that was smell. So now we're going to move on to taste, which is called gustation. And our gustatory receptors are located on the surface of our tongue. Now you all have tongues, right? You can look at these in the mirror. We'll be doing this in lab uh, activity as well. But most people are recognizing that their tongues are bumpy. And most people know about taste buds. But most people don't know that those bumps are not your taste buds. The taste buds are microscopic little cellular bundles. They're embedded in those bumps. The bumps are actually called papilla. Okay? And there's four types of papilla that can be found on your tongue. The first type is called valate or circumvallate if you have an older edition. It kind of creates a V, like a chevron shape on the very back of your tongue. And it's the largest... Um, papilla and it houses about a hundred taste buds per papilla so if you have like 10 circumvallate papillae you have about 10 a thousand taste buds just associated with the valate if i did my math right 100 times 10 is a thousand yeah um then we have foliate papillae 
These ones are found on the sides of the tongue. They almost make it look like gills, like your tongue has these little gill slits just on the side. And about five to 10 um, taste buds are associated with the foliate papilla. And then we have over the, the superior surface, most of the bumps that we can see visually are the fungiform papillae. Fungiform means mushroom-like. I guess they kind of look like a mushroom. Um, and they also have about five to 10 taste buds associated with that one papilla. Um, and then the last one are called filiform, and they're also distributed around the, the superior surface of the tongue. Um, they have no taste buds associated with them, so they're more of a friction gripper, so they help to kind of allow your tongue to move stuff around. So valet, foley, and fungiform have taste buds associated with them. Filiform do not, but they're all considered papillae, which means a little bump, so it kind of makes sense. We have all these bumps on our tongue. Now, when we're looking specifically at what a taste bud is, we've got to zoom in um, and take a look um, in the microscope. So here, I will circle, there's a couple good, you know, there's about five good taste buds that show up in that particular slice. And so this is what a taste bud is uh, in a drawing. So it's very similar to the olfactory um, epithelium in that we have the sensory cells um, squished in by these uh, supporting and transitional cells. So just like we had olfactory epithelium and the olfactory neurons were kind of scattered around about, we have these gustatory cells um, kind of helped and supported by these transitional and basal cells because they can replenish, right? If you've ever burnt your tongue on hot pizza or hot cocoa, you know that you don't lose your taste forever. We have the ability to regenerate these uh, receptor cells. Now, they are embedded in the, in the walls of the taste bud, kind of in the crevices. And to reach the, odor, or the food molecules, we chew our food, right, some big chunks to small chunks, and we mix that food chunks with saliva, which helps to dissolve the molecules. Just like the mucus in the nasal cavity helps to dissolve the odorant molecules, saliva in your mouth helps to dissolve the food molecules so they can make their way down the crevice, so this is my food molecule, do, 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 can seep down into the crevice, and then it finds its way into a taste pore, okay? The opening that these little hairs stick out. So microvilli or taste hairs are part of the cell structure. So these are not neurons, however. So if here's my gustatory cell, it's gonna have some hairs on it. And it is monitored by a sensory neuron here. So we are going to have our taste molecules come in and bind to receptors on the microvilli, on the taste hairs, and that will depolarize, activate the gustatory cell, which will then communicate and activate the, the monitoring neuron, this receptor or the um, sensory neuron, which would then sing the signal towards you, your gustatory cortex in your brain. So it works a slightly differently because it's uh, not a neuron. There's no dendrites that are picking up the um, chemical message. It is these gustatory cells, which then communicate to a monitoring sensory neuron. Okay. So of the tastes that we are able to recognize, we have, you might be familiar with these, we have salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. So other than the umami, most people are pretty familiar with that. Umami is a relatively new taste um, associated with our receptors. Um, umami is what's called savory. Um, think of like beef broth or Parmesan cheese, that kind of stuff. So that is our umami flavor or taste, I should say. Um, let's see. Salt and sour receptors are chemically gated channels. And sweet, bitter, and umami are G protein relate, uh, regulated. So where smell was all G protein, taste is a little mix between the chemically gated and uh, G protein. So it just depends on the actual food molecule and what kind of receptor will recognize it. Now, when we talk about flavor, flavor is more than just the tongue. It involves this, the olfaction as well. Um, a lot of the stuff that's happening with COVID, one of the signs and symptoms for people is they lose their sense of taste and smell. And I was reading some reports or some stories of people um, kind of documenting their symptoms and their side effects. And they're like, I've lost my taste and smell, but I can still distinguish sweet or salty or sour. So to me, and I'm no expert, but if you can still distinguish between those major tastes, I can tell that it's sweet, I can tell that it's sour or salty, but you can't tell like the overall flavor, it's probably more of a loss of your smell 
more than a loss of your taste because it is the combination of taste and smell that can give you the flavor of something. You might be able to tell that something's sweet, but is it sweet like um, a Starburst candy or is it sweet like a strawberry fruit or is it sweet like a chocolate um, chocolate chip? So there's all of these variations on sweet that the input of your olfaction gives you. And we have way more um, smell recognition than we do taste. We only have five flavors of taste, um, but we have hundreds of or thousands of different smell recognition, different smells that we can recognize. So that's kind of like my little application of what's going on with COVID right now. Um, also similar to our sense of smell, our sense of taste declines with age. Um, we do have the ability to regenerate those taste cells, but as we age, we lose some of those. They don't regenerate quite as uh, efficiently and so things might start tasting bland, more bland as we age. Um, okay, so I think that, uh, oh, sorry, one more slide of the physiology. So this is very similar to uh, the generator potential that's needed in um, olfaction. Um, here's that receptor cell that is monitored by the sensory neuron. So this is where the stimulus actually comes in and then it is transmitted to the sensory neuron, which then goes to your gustatory cortex. Um, but again, just one molecule of glucose is not going to trigger sweet. You're going to need quite a few of those sensory neurons to fire to um, make your brain recognize that particular sensation. Okay, so that, that wraps up taste and smell. Um, the next video is going to be starting our vision, which I'm going to do the first video on just anatomy of the eyeball before we get into the physiology. All right, I will see you then. Bye.